जिंदा खुदा से दिल जो लगाते तो खूब था जिंदा खुदा से दिल जो लगाते तो खूब था मुर्दा बुतों से जान मुर्दा बुतों से जान छुड़ाते तो खूब था Right, so can I request uh, Sayyid Taha to do the ta'at, please? Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, Assalamu. Begin, please. A'uzu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Aina mata kunu yudri Kumul mautu walau kuntum Fi burujim mushayyada Wa in tusibhum hasanat Yakulu hazihi min indillah Wa in tusibhum sayyiyat Yakulu hazihi min indik Kulkulum min indillah Famali haulail qawmi la yakaduna yakkahuna haditha English translation. Wheresoever you may be death will overtake you, even if you be in strongly built towers. And if some good befalls them, they say, this is from Allah. And if evil befalls them, they say, this is from thee. Say all is from Allah. What has happened? People. That they come not near understanding anything. Jazakallah. Welcome. Uh, Jazakallah. Thank you very much for that. Right. So today the topic is um, Did Hazrat Mazakala Muhammad alayhi salam die in a toilet? Um, so this obviously is one of the objections that uh, is raised uh, quite often whether they know anything or not, uh, still they'd like to raise it. And so we need to be able to answer it. So, um, as I said, the accusation is that Hazrat Mezaglam Muhammad died in the toilet. So they try to maintain that how, how can he really be a true prophet of Allah if Allah allowed him to die in such a dirty place? So therefore, this shows that he must be a false prophet. And Allah is punishing him for making this claim of being a prophet. So this is uh, the situation, and it's very sad to see how low sometimes people will stoop to try to find any weakness against Hazrat Meza Ghulam Ahmed alayhi salam. But this has always been the case and we look to the holy quran and we see and this is how normally i would begin to answer this that first look into the holy quran what does it say and here is one verse um, that uh, surely the messengers have been mocked at before thee but that which they mocked at encompassed those of them who scoffed at them or scoffed at it so the holy quran Oh, Allah makes it very clear. In fact, all his prophets have been mocked at by the people at any one time. Here, D is relating to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, and they didn't escape him either. They also mocked him. So why? You know, and this is why I try to get people to think about that. Why? Why are all the prophets being mocked at, being abused? And even why do they try and kill them? Because when we look at the prophet, we see that this is a very holy person, a very spiritual person, a very pious person. And we see that his message is very good. So why? Why did, for instance, the Quraysh mock, abuse and even try to kill the holy prophet? So this is what I try to get people to think that, look, just look at the holy prophet. 
Why is this? Was it because of the person? Whereas a Quresh themselves would say that he is Alameen, the most truthful, he is, um, sorry, the most trustworthy. He is Sadiq, the truthful one. So they knew that he was a very pious person. Maybe it was his message. But of course, the message is from God. And whether they believe it or not, still, it's from God. It's a good message. He's not telling them to go and kill themselves or anything bad. And I think the question could understand that what he's saying, whether they like it or not, what he's saying is true. So then why? Why did the question mock, abuse and even try to kill the Holy Prophet? And this is what I try and get them to think about, first of all. So you can see that Mecca was a market town. It relied on people coming to worship the idols and buy at the markets. This is the main thing that all around Arabia, all around Mecca in Arabia, people came because of the idols. And there were 360 idols in or around the Holy Kaaba. And so, of course, while they were there, then they would buy and sell in the markets. So. We know that the uh, people of Mecca, they used to go on the caravans, they used to go to far off places to buy goods and they would sell at this time. They made money. But the Quresh leaders, they feared that if, if they allowed for the worship of one God, then who's going to come? Who's going to come to worship? And if they don't come to worship, they're not going to buy. And if they don't buy, it means that Mecca is going to get into a very t terrible situation because this was the livelihood. It was a market town. It relied on goods being bought and sold. So therefore, they felt that if they allowed this to worship one God, the people would turn against them and say, why have you done this? We were having so many people coming to worship the idols, but now they're not coming because you have allowed them to worship one God. And so therefore, the main reasons was that they were scared of losing their power, losing their position. And so this is why they opposed the holy prophets. Of course, the issue of the one God or the idols was there. But this was the real thing. It was economic. It was because uh, of lack of money would bring about their downfall, which they didn't really want. So let's go to the next prophet before that. Why did the Jewish leaders mock, abuse, and even try to kill Jesus, alayhi salam? Again, he was a good person. There's no doubt people knew that this was a good person. His message was the Torah. He was explaining what the Jewish leaders were themselves teaching. So why did they mock him? Why did they abuse him? Why did they try to kill him? So again, if we analyze this, we see that the Jewish leaders, they weren't guiding the people properly. They weren't practicing what they preach. And we see the example where they were selling goods in the temple and the, uh, the Jesus came along and, and pushed over the table and said, you can't be selling goods in the table. This is a holy place. Why are you selling in the, the temple? We see that when Jesus plucked some corn, they complained about this. And he was trying to explain to them, look, yes, you should not work on the Sabbath, but you can eat. And if a baby is going to be uh, born, you can deliver the baby and, and certain things you can do. So understand the spirit behind the law. But the Jewish leaders, they again were fearful that if they if the Jews accepted Jesus, he was speaking against them. And so they feared again of losing their power, losing their position. And so for this reason, they turned against Jesus. Now, once we understand this. We can now look at why. Why was the Muslim leaders turned against the promised Messiah? Again, he was known as a champion in Islam. They knew this. They were often calling him to be that person who would debate with the Christians, would debate with the Hindus. So why? Why was it? What was his message? His message was the Quran, Islam. So it was a good message. Why then did the Muslim leaders turn against him? And again, we see that Hazrat Mazaklam Ahmed was criticizing the Muslim leaders. They were not guiding the Muslim properly. They were not practicing what they preached, just like Jesus, the Jews. The same thing was happening here in the time of the promised Messiah. That what were these leaders doing? 
they not, and we see today the message they're giving is one of hate, one of terrorism. This is not Islam. So again, the Muslim leaders feared that if people listened to this guy who was claiming to be the Messiah, he was speaking against them. And so they feared losing their power, losing their position. And so therefore they turned against him. But you just can't turn against a prophet. You've got to find some reasons. And so we come to today's subject that did he die in the toilet? So they say that how, as I said, how can he be possibly a prophet if he died in such a dirty place like a toilet? But where is the proof? This is the thing. Where's the witnesses who saw where he passed away? You need witnesses, surely. So when we look at the facts, we see a different thing. First is that the facts are that there were no witnesses claiming that they saw him die in the toilet. He died in his house, in his bedroom. And the witnesses there who were around him, no one has said that he died in the toilet. So where's this come from? Where's the proof? Where's the witnesses? If we read our books, it's not written in any of our books that this is where he died. It's maybe from their books, but in our books, you don't find this. The doctor was there, and it's, this is an important thing. The doctor was there, but the doctor himself didn't state that he found him in the toilet. So, again, why was the doctor there? We'll come to that in a minute. But this is another important fact, that this was not an allegation at a time of the promised site. They hated him. The leaders had turned against him. Now they had a perfect proof. They say, look where he died. But this point was not raised at that time. This allegation, it came much later. But as I said, what was it based on? I mean, anybody can make any story they like. They need to have some facts. But there's no proof that this is a certainty. It's just lies that they made up. An allegation that someone has said, and it's just grew and grew and grew to. Nowadays, people see it online or whatever and just say it without even thinking about the facts. So let's look at those facts again. Hazrat Mazak Glam Ahmed alayhi salam died in Lahore. We know this as a fact. He went to Lahore with, with his family. It's been documented, we know this. He went and whilst he was in Lahore, the members uh, asked him to deliver some speeches and he also met members of the community. So we notice this is a fact. Whilst he was in Lahore, he also wrote his last book, Pagamul Salah, Sula, the message of peace. So again, this is a fact, it's well documented that this was written at the time when he was in Lahore. On the 20th of May, 1908, Hazrat Mazaklam Ahmed Salam received his last revelation, which was in Arabic and in English it is, it is the time of the de of departure. Yes, it is the time of departure and death is near. So here, Allah, again, he's been constantly warning him, but again, Allah is saying that your time of death is very, very close. Hazrat Mazaklam Ahmed alayhi salam sadly passed away on the 26th of May. 1908, at the age of 73 years old. This is a fact. There's no doubt in this. We clearly say this in our books. The next fact is that he was buried in Kardian at Bahisti Abara, Akbara, the heavenly graveyard. Now, bear in mind where he died. He died in Lahore. He had to get to Kardian. And so they had to take him by train from Lahore to um, the nearest train station, I think it's Amwista. So in order to do that, the doctor had to examine him to ensure that he had no contagious diseases. So this was a fact that the doctor did examine him because the body had to be transferred by train. They had to make sure that he didn't die of any contagious disease. So we noticed that the doctor did this examination. He then issued a death certificate but in that death certificate, death certificate, there was no mention of him dying by cholera. This is, again, one of the things that they say, that he died from cholera. But this is a contagious disease. 
and he didn't he was allowed to travel by train so this is again a false allegation that they made nor is there any mention of him dying in the toilet not that they would normally put that in a death certificate but anyway the doctor didn't write it all the doctor said was that he died from complications arising from some severe diarrhea now of course someone suffering from diarrhea that would naturally weaken the body and that weakness led to eventual death but that doesn't mean that he died in the toilet it just means that he was suffering from severe diarrhea so where now has come this proof that he died in the toilet as i said his body was taken from the hall to oh here we are patala by train so these are facts we also know that the companions hearing about his death they all met up and they carried the body of the prophesy on their shoulders to Kardian, which is a distance of 11 miles but such was the devotion of his followers and as i said he was buried the next day in bahishti makbara so these are the facts and this is how we need to try to present these facts to the people and say right now you bring us your facts where is it that you any fact to show that he died in a toilet now i've also mentioned here the age of the uh promised messiah this is a right this is the grave of the promised messiah and of course these days um it's been uh fenced off because some people were going there taking stones and things and worshipping the stones, Hindus, things like this. So it's in a special enclosure in uh, Bahishti Makbar. So, as I said, we've mentioned that he died at the age of 73 years old. But again, some allegations are there that the promiscide said he would live to be 80 or so years old. So this is what they say, that uh, again, this prophecy has been proven to be false because he only lived to 73 years of age. Now, when we actually look at the proper prophecy, it says 80 years or a few years less or more. So it's not exactly eight years. It can be a few years more or a few years less. The other thing we need to bear in mind that the 73 is the solar calendar, that we same calendar that we have in this country. But when you take the lunar calendar, which is 10 days shorter, then that would mean that he lived to 75 years old, according to the lunar calendar, which is the Islamic calendar that we follow. And so going back to that prophecy of 80 years, a few years less or more, 75 years is a few years less. So we believe that he fulfilled that uh, prophecy as well. So this is how I would answer these allegations. And now, uh, as usual, we will put it to everybody for any comments or any questions or any way that they would answer this particular uh, allegation. So now the ball again comes into your court. So who's going to be the first? Assalamualaikum, Marisai. Welcome, Assalamualaikum. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, they're not entirely related to the topic. Do you still want me to read them out? Yeah, please. Yeah, so the first question is um, that Islam is a complete religion. Then what was the need for Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Islam, to come? All right, okay, that's very good. And that's a very commonly asked question. That why? Why do we need the Prophet Islam, to come? The thing is that uh, I normally again would answer this, that in the farewell pilgrimage of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sassam, he said, I will leave you two things behind. If you follow these two things, you will never go astray. One was the Holy Quran. The second is the Sunnah. Uh, some hadith say the family of the Prophet. Sahib. But anyway, now the Prophet, uh, sorry, family of the Holy Prophet. So the Holy Prophet has made it very clear that if we follow the Holy Quran and we follow the Sunnah, the Hadith, we will never go astray. Very, very clear. Now, Alhamdulillah, the Holy Quran we have today is exactly the same as the Holy Quran in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. So, exactly the same. So we have all the guidance we need. We have the Hadith books, so many Hadith books, 
we have the life of the Holy Prophet, the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet. We have all the guidance we need. So according to the Holy Prophet, therefore, we will not go astray. Look at the Muslim world. Look at the Muslim world today. First thing, unity. Is there unity? The Holy Prophet himself warned us of this time. He said there will be 73 sects in Islam. And 72 of them will go into hell. 72 sects will go into hell. And only one will be uh, going to paradise. And when asked, who's that one? Again, he said, the ones that follow my sunnah. So 72 sects of Muslims will go into hell. That shows the poor state of Islam that is so divided. And to this day, it is still so divided. The second is that, are they following the Holy Quran? Are they following the teachings? And we see so many different things have come in, crept into Islam that there's a need to know what is the actual Holy Quran stating. So coming to the question, what was the need of the promised Messiah? And it's these two things, A, unity, and B, guidance. We're saying promised Messiah, but his other title is Imam Mahdi. Now we explain this in a different class. As an Imam, we follow the Imam. And so obviously everyone follows the Imam, that creates the unity. If everyone accepts Hazrat Mazaglam Ahmed alayhi salam, you will have unity. That's the only way that you can get unity in Islam. If the Muslims uh, uh, pick a leader, if the Sunnis pick a leader, there's no way the Shiites are going to set that leader. If the Shiites pick a leader, there's no way the Sunnis are going to pick a leader. Let alone all the different sects, even the two major groups, they will not accept each other. But if everyone accepts the promise of Messiah alayhi salam, as the Imam, so therefore you get that unity. Mahdi means guided one. He gets guidance from Allah. He guides the Muslims as to what is the true teachings of Islam. You read any book of the Promise of Sayyid Islam, he will explain the Holy Quran, what is the true teachings of the Holy Quran for this day and age. When we think about Islam today, you ask most people, they say Islam is a religion of hate. It's a religion of terrorism. Whereas Islam means peace. What has happened? How come it's not a religion of peace? Why is it a religion of hate and terrorism? And that's because they rejected the promise of Messiah later on. So it's important for Muslims of this day and age to accept the promise of Messiah. And by accepting the promise of Messiah, they're not going against the Holy Prophet. They're not going against the Holy Quran. They're not going against his Sunnah or Hadith. In fact, it, he supports all those things. He's explaining what the true teachings of Islam is. And so he's come to revive the true teachings of Islam, hence the need of the promised Messiah, alayhi salam. I hope that's uh, answered the question for you. Has anybody else got anything they want to say? Was there other chats you said? Uh, uh, before I read the next question out, I would just like to say, um, if there's anyone who likes to ask, a, who would like to ask a question live right now, uh, they have the opportunity to ask now. Um, if not, then I can read the next question of the chat. Welcome, sir. Um, Rabbi Sahib, I just wanted to know, um, before the promised Messiah uh, came to claim that he is the Messiah, uh, what were the signs given uh, to him by Allah, um, you know, to, um, to say to him uh, that he is the Messiah? And my second question is, that um, are there still people out there who claim that they're the Nabi or that, that they're the Messiah? Okay, I mean, these questions, we've been asking them before. Um, maybe some of you haven't been in those um, lessons. Uh, maybe you need to repeat some of those lessons. Obviously, uh, the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam, or Hazrat Zaglam Ahmed, alayhi salam, he can't claim to be a prophet. He's got to be told by Allah. So it's only once he's told by Allah that you're a prophet, can you claim to be a prophet? This is very clear in Islam that uh, anyone who is a false prophet, Allah was seizing by his life archery. Again, coming to the topic that we're talking about today, that they say he, if he died in the uh, toilet, then this is a disgrace. And this is how Allah seized him. Well, there's obviously the point that uh, how long does it take Allah to seize him? Because when he claimed to be a prophet, 
uh, it was over 28 years before he actually died. So for 28 years, Allah hasn't disgraced him. And then suddenly, right after 28 years, he gets disgraced. It doesn't make any sense. But anyway, this is one of the criteria that um, found in the Holy Quran that uh, a person cannot claim to be a prophet unless he is told by Allah. So with the case of Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know that before and he used to believe like other Muslims that Jesus was alive in heaven. But right from the beginning, Allah kept addressing him as Jesus. Even we find in Surah, uh, in Rahim Ahmadiyya, in the very first book that he wrote, Allah is addressing him as Jesus. And this continuously went on and on until finally Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam thought, well, there's something wrong here. Why is God calling me Jesus? I'm not Jesus. Jesus, he believed, was alive in heaven. And so he looked into what the Holy Quran taught. And he was amazed to find that it's very clear in the Holy Quran. We think we've covered this already. It's very clear in the Holy Quran that Jesus died and no one can come back from heaven. No one can be physically alive in heaven and come back. But just to make sure, he then looked into the Bible. And about the death of Jesus in the Bible, again, we've already covered this. And again, he found it very, very clear that Jesus was dead, according to the Holy Bible as well. So now he understood what God meant when he was dressing him as Jesus, that it's not physically Jesus coming from heaven because Jesus was dead, but it would be a spiritual second coming. The same qualities as Jesus of love and forgiveness he will be giving love and forgiveness to the Muslims, just as Jesus brought love and forgiveness to the Jews. So this is how we understand it, that once he understood this process, and then he understood why God was referring to him as a prophet, why God was calling him Jesus, and then he made the claim. But unless you understand these things, you can't just say that I'm a Muslim. Uh, sorry, I'm a prophet. So he had to understand first. He had to fully understand and then he announced it. So this is why he claimed to be the uh, the promised Messiah. Now, this is what I feared that I was going to forget about the second part of your question. So what was the second part again, please? Uh, so the second part was uh, whether there um, uh, whether there are people out there who you know claim that they are the Messiah mm. in in today's um, you know day. Right. So again, we, we we have covered this before, uh, but false prophets, like I say, um, anyone can claim to be a false prophet. This is one of the arguments that they raise against us as well, that the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sassam warned against false prophets, that there be 30 liars. And so they say that Hazrat Mazda Ghulam Ahmed Islam, is one of those false prophets. Of course, it's true that this is what the Holy Prophet said, but he also said that Jesus will be coming back. So he's also talking about a prophet coming back. So even though there will be false prophets, there still needs to be a true prophet. So the thing is, like I say, to know a true prophet, there is a criteria found in the holy books. I think we've, we've covered it already. Uh, I think maybe next week we'll cover this again uh, because it is quite important to know the truthfulness of the promised Messiah. So anyway, uh, so there's a criteria. So if anyone's claiming to be a false prophet, you look at that criteria and judge him accordingly. Otherwise, of course, how we know a person's a prophet or not. Do we go to the leaders? As we say here, the Muslim leaders, they all turned against Hazrat Mazda Glamamad. So is that enough proof that because the leaders say that he's false, he must be proof? Well, as I said right from the beginning, that every prophet, when he came, he was mocked by his people. His people being the leaders of that time, they mocked him. They turned against that prophet. So this is not criteria. Just because the Muslim leaders or any leaders say that this person is false, he must be false. So there is a criteria and we need to judge a claimant according to that criteria. So because obviously we believe that uh, the Holy Prophet Muhammad prophesies the coming of Jesus, there would be other claimants, and there has been other claimants. But when we look at this criteria, they've gone on the wayside. They, they've been proved false. So like I say, maybe we'll go through that again, because uh, it was a long time ago when we had that particular class. So maybe we'll go through that again. I'll speak to uh, Toby later on, and we'll decide whether to 
uh, go through this criteria again for the people. Okay, any other questions um, or any chats that's been given there? If huh? uh, no one else wants to ask a question, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one of, well, there's two questions that are quite related. <clears throat> I'll read both of them out. It says, uh, why did Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Islam, create another sect? Why not follow the existing Islam? And then the other question is, Allah says, don't okay, create... Okay, well, well, one, one at a time, because uh, otherwise I forget. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let me answer that one first. So why create another sector? Again, I think we may have covered this, but anyway, no problem. It's good that people keep asking these questions because as we're doing these classes, so more and more questions come to people's minds. And even if we've covered it, it's good to revise it. So please don't worry about whether we've covered subjects before. It's good to ask. The thing is that obviously, uh, the Hazrat Muslim Ahmed Islam, he was a Muslim. He was born a Muslim and of course, he could have continued following Islam. But uh, two things happened. First thing is, how is he going to make a difference between what he's teaching and what other Muslims teach? So if we call ourselves Sunni Muslims. And we are, if you go to the two branches of Shiite and Sunni, we are more inclined to Sunni because the original uh, division was about whether Hazrat Ali was a true Khalifa or was there uh, the four khalifas beforehand? So we accept the four khalifas, the four cloth to a shield, uh, which is a Sunni belief. We don't believe that uh, three, the first three were false, which is a Shiite belief. So we could have called himself, he could have called himself a Sunni Muslim. He was born a Sunni Muslim. He could have continued doing that. But when we look at the world today, what are Sunni Muslims doing? We've just seen recently about how one Suppose Sunni Muslim chopped up her person's head off because he didn't like him blaspheming. Is this Sunni Muslim? Is this Islam? We will be bracketed in the same thing. So we had to make a difference to show that this is the true Islam. If you look at Ahmadiyya, this is the true Islam. Compare us to other Muslims and find out what is the true Islam. So that was the first thing. He had to make a distinction to show people that what is actually our teachings separate from what is the, the normal general teachings found with the Sunni Muslims or the Shiite Muslims. The second was that the opportunity came in 1901 where a census was being made in India. And at that time, you had to put what religion you uh, followed. So he then decided to create Ahmadiyyat and told his followers that don't just put Sunni Muslims, put Ahmadiyya Muslims. And so that's how the Kuwait, uh, the Jamaat started. Uh, but the reason, as I said, for that was so that he could show a distinction between what he is teaching to what unfortunately is a present day teaching. So as far as we're concerned, there is only one Islam. This is what Allah has made very, very clear in the Holy Quran. Do not create division. But by the time of Hazrat Mr. Khalam Ahmed, there was already 72 or more sects that's happened. So the division was already there. Adding one more is not going to make any difference. He didn't cause that division. That division started right from the beginning. But now to unite all the Muslims, he's got to show what is a true Islam. So now he's telling all the Muslims, Sunni, Shiite, anyone, even those that are not Muslims, that if you want to see the true Islam, look at Ahmadiyyat. And that shows you what is the true Islam, what is the Islam of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, what Islam is being taught in the Holy Quran. So if you want to see that true teachings, this is the way to find out what it is. It's why he had no choice, but he had to um, create a sect to make that division, to make it clear what is the true teachings of Islam. OK, so what was the second question that you was going to ask? Uh, uh, before I ask the second question, um, I'm if I want to ask the question, so you can go ahead and... Yeah, sure, please. So yeah, my, please. Uh, my question is, um, it's not related to the, the subject, it's uh, to do with um, the situation in France. Uh, what is the, uh, our Jamaat's stance on what's going on uh, in France right now? I mean, obviously, we're, 
against uh, any form of terrorism. So um, naturally, that's always our stance. Uh, I don't know what the official um, Jamaat has done, what they've done a letter. I presume they've written some sort of letter, uh, but I'm not aware of that. But of course, uh, any form of terrorism, uh, we're against such things and we'll always be against this. This is not what Islam teaches. You know perfectly well the blasphemy law. We are affected by that blasphemy law, the same blasphemy law. Muslims try to kill us. So this is not what the Holy Quran teaches. So as far as we're concerned, we try to make it clear what is the true teachings of Islam. So in this particular case, you should explain that this is not uh, correct what he did. And everyone has, of course, the freedom of speech, uh, if that's what they want. Obviously, they should be thinking about the speech and making sure that it's not abusive or anything like this. And of course, that's why in UK, for instance, we had the slander law and things like this to prevent people from just saying any, any nonsense. So you should be thinking about what you're saying. But I mean, in this particular case, I presume you're talking about the, the teacher. In this particular case, he was trying to use the example of um, freedom of speech. And he asked, that, he told the Muslims that, look, this is what I'm going to talk about. If you don't want to be offended, you're welcome not to be in the class. And he allowed them permission, look, they don't have to be there. And the Muslims left. They didn't actually hear what he was saying. Unfortunately, it's again spreading um, wrong messages around. And so this person reacted in a very, very bad way. So we don't support that at all. This is totally un-Islamic. I don't know, um, maybe Toby knows whether the Jamaat has actually uh, given out any letter, um, but I'm not aware of any letter uh, addressing the MPs or anything like this. Toby, do you know anything about that? Yeah, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Rabbi Sahib, Zakalai, to be here. Um, I haven't uh, got any letter, uh, but I just want to refer to the previous incidents which has been happening. Obviously, this is one of them. Uh, for example, the London Bridge and some other um, attacks which has been taking place. Um, I cannot quote very clearly whether Beloved Huzul um, mentions that um, everything happens, it's an opportunity for us as an MDs to utilize as a tabligh. As I said, I don't have a clear quotation, but I want to utilize this advantage to, um, to add what Murabi Saba just said, that there's no clear messages come across, um, but I think there's a press release which came, I might have seen, obviously when um, Jamaat is condemning the atrocity which took place. But today, this is an advantage for Jamaat level to do a peace conference immediately. Um, if they can, in response to this, um, they can hold an um, event like this on the Jamaat level. They can hold event like this on the Lajna Imaila level. They can do this event on the Ansar level. They can do event like this, Khudam, this point of time now that the young youth, which are called as Khudam Lamadia and Lajna, they are the selling cake into the world today because these are very fragile two organizations youth, which is Khudam, and Lajna, which is ladies. So we should utilize these avenues straight away now. We don't need to do a lot of work. What you need to do is create a link, put a link outside, give people two knots, and request all members to put in the effort. The event I last attended was the Glasgow. Uh, it was uh, organized by the Jamaat of Scotland. Uh, it was response to this brutality and the event was well attended. Uh, actually, Ibrahim Ikhlaf Saab was the, the main speaker. He answered all of these questions. Does Islam teach that you should kill another person because of insult? Also, it is an avenue for us to utilize any Muslim today on the social media, they are actually uh, one way or the other, they are attacking us, they are attacking everybody and they say, why are you not joining us? The fact of the matter is, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Quran says, Laka di kana lakum fi Rasulillahi uswatan hasan. 
you have the best example of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if our Lajina, our children, they are discussing, or even ourselves, we are discussing about these current issues, including with the Muslims themselves, we should actually put to them, what was the response of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during his lifetime? When there was abuse, they attacked him, they beat him, what was the response? He would have gathered the companions around and start chopping people necks off but he didn't so that is the best example we need to share but to conclude that i think the lajna imaila khudamla ahmadiyya and sarla all on the jamaat level this is a very very great opportunity for us to do event whereby people want to see what is the response from the muslim community because they don't know people think that we are all the same murabi sab that's what i had to add shukran Okay, I think if you're going to hold a function, then you should first of all go to Fuid Ahmed, the uh, UK Amoy Khawaja Secretary, to get some guidance uh, from him and maybe what is the official Jamaat uh, stance or something like this, or Ibrahim Ikhla. Um, so I would advise that before holding such a function, get permission from the centre first, don't go flying into it. But yes, I mean, anything like this, uh, any opportunity, people will keep raising these things. And it's the same, uh, as you just mentioned, there's been, unfortunately, many acts of terrorism over the years. And of course, the Jamaat always uh, responds by uh, rejecting such things that this has got nothing to do with the true teachings of Islam. So that should be our stance. But to hold a meeting, um, yeah, I think you should first seek permission from the centre before uh, holding such a meeting. But anyway, that's up to yourselves, but that's my advice I would give. Okay, any other questions or anything else uh, that anybody wants to say? I'm wary of the time as well. I know it's uh, it's gone past the actual time. So has anybody got anything else? I think there was another chat, was there? Uh, yes, Maurice, there's a question in the chat. It's um, It says, Allah says, don't create sects. Why did Mirza Islam start a new sect? Okay, I've answered that. We yeah. need to the same answer. <laughs> uh, it's already been answered. So hopefully um, the answer I gave was sufficient. Okay, so anybody else got anything to say or shall we finish it there? Uh, if there's no more questions on Khadi society, I think, Murabi Saab, yes, with your permission, we can finish, inshallah. All right. Okay, if there's no more questions, as I said, if there is questions, please send them in and uh, obviously we can try and answer a bit later on. Okay, please can you join me in silent prayers. Bismillah. I'm sorry, Amin. Amin. Okay. Jazakum Allah. Jazakum Allah. Jazakum Allah. Jazakum Allah. Jazakum Allah.